Hello, everybody. Um, so let's start. Um, I'm going to talk about the BSD family of operating systems, which started off life um, at the University of uh, Berkeley. Uh, in 1977, Ken Thompson took a sabbatical uh, from Bell Labs and went to uh, Berkeley with a copy of uh, version 6 Unix and uh, uh, got uh, deployed um, at the university. And um, over its uh, lifetime, it grew up um, from a set of patches and improvements uh, to AT&T Unix to something more substantial where <coughs> bar six files uh, to the operating system um, that was a complete operating system that was not under the licensing terms of AT&T. Uh, the importance of this is that uh, when um, AT&T Unix first started out, the licensing terms were, what the licensing costs were about $10,000. And towards the uh, end of the 80s, um, the licensing costs had crept up to about $250,000. And this was a problem for people who wanted to use components from um, the Berkeley software distribution, um, but didn't want to necessarily uh, cough up a uh, quarter of a million dollars uh, for an AT&T license. Uh, so uh, what happened was uh, several releases were made uh, which removed this unencumbered code. And by 1990, I guess, um, they had a release which uh, barred these six files um, uh, but these six files uh, was open to, for anyone to have uh, without any um, licensing. Uh, what happened, what, what the, the things, the components of significance that were developed here were things such as the VI editor, uh, the Unix file system, uh, the virtual memory subsystem, um, and of course the reference implementation of the TCP IP networking stack which everybody uses. Um, when the development at the uh, University of Berkeley stopped, um, several open source projects sprung up uh, to build um, on this code. So the project that we have now is uh, NetBSD, which was the first project six months down the line, FreeBSD. Um, later on, OpenBSD forked from NetBSD. And um, in the last uh, decade, Dragonfly forked from FreeBSD. Um, so they all share a common heritage, but their development of um, their focus on the area of development is in a different direction uh, from each other. Um, so you have this operating system that's been developed for a very long time, and um, it's very well documented. From 1989, there was the design and implementation of the 4.3 BSD. And then more recently, in 2014, there was the design and implementation of the uh, FreeBSD 10 operating system. Um, aside from the actual books that uh, cover the internals, um, the actual man pages and uh, various handbooks for the projects um, do a pretty good job at um, covering the internals of the operating system and how to operate it. So this means that if you want to do something, you don't end up start, uh, going off on a tangent on Google trying to find something that vaguely resembles the operating system that you're running and uh, trying that out. The actual, it's, it, it, if the component <coughs> is not documented, it's a bug. So, um, and there's docu there's, um, each project has a documentation team which uh, will uh, cater for that. Um, the most famous one is actually the FreeBSD project. The <coughs> documentation uh, uh, team on there is uh, fairly strong, and the handbook does a really good job at um, accommodating new users and uh, covering what you need to do uh, or uh, how you go about actually deploying and running the system um, in a fairly good way. Um, so NetBSD. Uh, NetBSD continued um, the research stance of the uh, computer science research group of Berkeley and uh, their focus was to get NetBSD on running on as many operating uh, on many devices as possible and really churn the code to make it uh, portable um, so 
it's fairly effortless to add new support for new CPUs and architectures. I think at, at present, um, there's some 50 plus uh, different systems that you can run NetB NetBSD on from your um, virtual machine on uh, Zen to uh, old uh, PDAs which run Windows CE but can boot NetBSD uh, to your VAX um, and stuff in between. Actually Dreamcast, that's a pretty <laughs> fairly, fairly popular uh, thing that's referenced. Um, and there's part of the, and there's some nice uh, features that are unique to the uh, project as well. So there's the test suite um, for the actual uh, source uh, source code, so you can do regression testing um, on your changes and um, things like that. Uh, the build infrastructure is completely uh, decoupled from the actual host operating system. So this means that you don't actually have to run NetBSD to actually be able to build it and adapt it. Um, as long as you have a fairly POSIX y operating system, um, you can bootstrap the tool chain um, and build the operating system. Uh, and the other thing is, is you don't need root priv privileges. Uh, you can actually just run as a standard user and build things just in your home directory, um, and off you go. Uh, for FreeBSD, they decided uh, they were going to focus on uh, performance and x86 and uh, develop for the uh, PC at the time. But then when Digital released their alpha CPU, uh, they adopted, uh, the, well, they ported uh, to this architecture because it was a 64-bit um, architecture and it would give them uh, some an opportunity to test the code base um, in a 64-bit environment. Um, they continued with that until the uh, 2000s when uh, Compaq eventually killed the alpha and so uh, it was deemed no longer viable to continue maintaining this. But since then, uh, FreeBSD has kind of uh, adapted to um, ARM, MIPS um, and various research projects uh, such as the Berry, which is based on MIPS, that was presented here at OSHUG. Um, more importantly, um, ARM V8, or the 64-bit uh, version of ARM, and uh, Cavium hardware, uh, there's full support for that in um, FreeBSD. Or if you're experimenting with um, more um, cutting-edge ISAs, such as the RISC-V, um, FreeBSD is the first operating system to support uh, the RISC-V um, CPU um, uh, out of the box, though there is actually no hardware. It's all it was all done on the Spike simulator. Um, anybody actually doing stuff with Risk Five? Ah, oh, cool. So, okay, so, um, so OpenBSD, which uh, forked off from uh, NetBSD, uh, decided to focus on the uh, security side of things, um, and just audit the co code base and refine it um, so that uh, any potential uh, security problems are ironed out. Um, over the years, um, they've uh, developed uh, some uh, interesting uh, components that have seen them um, proliferate in the Unix environment, um, such as uh, various functions in their libc, um, and more recently, their fork of OpenSSL, uh, which uh, ends up uh, refining the code base of OpenSSL and removing some of the bizarre things that uh, were still there until um, in the last year or so. Um, outside of that, uh, things like uh, the firewall that they developed called PF, uh, that's recently seen adoption from Apple and Oracle for uh, replacing IP filter um, as the default operating um, firewall in the operating system. They also have a, a strong uh, angle on advocacy on open systems and things like that. So they were the first project to adopt uh, an open development model where you have an open repository uh, which everybody can uh, <coughs> observe the development of and um, complain, well not complain, fight against uh, binary blobs which seems to be uh, acceptable for some uh, uh, projects. So 
uh, OpenBSD were the first uh, guys to reverse engineer the Atheros wireless drivers um, so that there was a permissively licensed um, driver uh, for people to use um, rather than the blob that was kind of uh, Linux specific. Um, yeah. uh, so Dragonfly BSD forked off from um, Open uh, sorry, FreeBSD in the 2000s because of the difference in opinion uh, with regards to scaling the system um, and uh, took it, uh, continued in the logical uh, path that the old FreeBSD uh, uh, system was uh, doing. Um, the, their focus is on kind of uh, clustering and uh, many CPU uh, systems and uh, refining the, the scheduler to be able to uh, take advantage of that. Um, outside, of the, uh, outside of that, they also developed an interesting file system called Hammer, uh, which has similar properties to ZFS um, in terms of um, journaling uh, and uh, scaling across uh, many disks. Now, uh, all of these operating systems have a, a framework for building uh, embedded images. So if you want to uh, take the operating system and actually just strip it down into a, a minimal subset that you want to boot on, a, um, say, a, a router or something with a very small amount of flash, uh, all of the bar um, Dragonfly BSD, there's a framework to actually allow you to do that. Um, the other thing is, is the, the build infrastructure for this um, everything is self-contained. So to be able to build the operating system, actually it's only one command. Make build world, that builds your operating system. Um, and it comes with the version of the compiler that is intended to build the source code. So it means that you don't have to go on a, a ram rampage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to go trawling for a, 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 a tool chain that's actually going to uh, work for your operating system. Everything is there, you just uh, need to put it into place and run a command and off you go. Um, so the first, uh, the first two are actually FreeBSD specific. Uh, Jibbed is for NetBSD and uh, FlashDisk is um, for OpenBSD and that will uh, generate uh, uh, an image that you can put onto a, uh, a flash device um, and it will take advantage of things like uh, RAM disks and stuff like that so uh, you don't have to do much. Um, so going back to the original work of the CSRG that was done in the, in the 70s, that's still of um, significance to this day. Um, one of the employees at uh, MIPS uh, decided to take the um, code for uh, the PDP and um, port it to the PIC microcontroller, which has this um, MIPS core inside. Um, and so you have this um, project called RetroBSD, uh, which takes 211 BSD and uh, runs it on your uh, PIC controller. You have about 96 kilobytes of RAM out of the 128K. Um, there's no network stack, but you have a familiar environment to kind of work with. The, important of the, the importance of this is that you don't end up having to relearn every time as you move from different architectures and hardware. There's a common set of uh, skills and um, knowledge that you build on. And because the development uh, is fairly well documented, uh, you can take a modern system and look at what you have from the old system and work out actually what's, um, what's not there and uh, what needs to be adapted to kind of accommodate. Um, uh, PIC actually released a new microcontroller with more RAM, which meant that you could actually accommodate uh, a networking stack. So he went back and uh, created a new project called LightBSD, which takes the 4.4 BSD, which was the last uh, code drop of uh, CSRG, and now you can run that on your PIC microcontroller as well. Um, kind of big names who've uh, kind of jumped on board with this and uh, uh, run with it. Um, NASA used uh, the NetBSD networking stack for uh, network testing in space. Um, and uh, satellites. Um, they use package source um, on their uh, build clusters, which is a cross-platform um, packaging system um, 
which allows you to unify uh, your set of software that you use in your different environments. Uh, Android uses the OpenBSD libc um, instead of um, the GNU one for security. And uh, they also use a version of KSH, which was developed in, um, in BSD as well. Uh, for Toyota, there was actually a series of pictures that kind of hit Reddit recently where somebody poked at their dashboard and realized there was all these BSD uh, <laughs> licenses um, in their car. Um, and it seems that actually, I think there might be, a, a, a from the discussion that went around, there was actually QNX, but there's bits of OpenBSD in the Toyota people carry a thing. <laughs> um, and of course, um, Apple uh, uses FreeBSD for the Darwin, or the underpinning of OS X, um, and uh, the uh, airport uh, access points. Um, and the list kind of goes on. But that's not so much um, more in the networking world and storage world rather than um, small appliances. So why would you want to use this as opposed to something else? Um, the licensing uh, is uh, fairly liberal. Um, you know, do as you please, don't sue me. Um, the, the projects are fairly well structured and very accommodating to new developers, and there's an enrollment process for that. Um, if you're self-driven or are able to read documentation, um, it's, uh, you can get up to speed fairly quickly and uh, get going. There's a good process for mentorship. Uh, you don't have to, uh, it's, uh, your, what you end up uh, learning is applicable to other areas, so it's not something that you have to kind of relearn every time. Um, so on one hand, there is this uh, uh, established process, but on the other hand, we don't have something like System D and uh, Know, targeted for laptop development, but you run it on your server. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, any questions?